Folks, welcome to Sanger Bible Church. My name is Pete. I have the privilege to, to pastor here, and uh, I'm glad that we get together here this week. I um, hope you all are well, excited for, for today and uh, our, our time we will spend, and I'm sure some of you guys are all excited for what is about to happen uh, at around 3 o'clock later on this afternoon. Um, but um, before that, folks, um, today we are closing up our sermon series, The Gathering, today. It's been a five-week sermon series, and, and we began in the beginning of the year. We, we asked the question, why do we gather the second week, we, we, uh, we, we said, man, we gather to hear and to learn God's word. The third week, we saw that we gather to fellowship. Last week, if you were here, you saw that we gather to pray. And today, as we close out this service, it's we gather to scatter. We gather here to scatter. Now, question, what does that mean exactly, like to, to, to scatter around? Like, what does it mean to gather here on Sundays, on Wednesdays, or whenever it may be, and then to scatter? Just so we can all be on the same page, God is in the business of redeeming people back to him. And this has been his goal, his, his main goal from, from the get-go, uh, of, uh, from the get-go of when his relationship with Adam and Eve was broken in the garden. Ever since then, he has been on this pursuit to redeem his people back to him. In the Old Testament, he used all, all these people, prophets, judges, all sorts of people, kings, to tell everyone about God and how they ought to live for him. But then later on, after all of that happens, Jesus himself, God himself, becomes flesh, and he, is, and he walks this earth, and he becomes part of this pursuit of redeeming people back to him. But while on earth, he walks around, and instead of saying, God the Father, he, he points to himself. He says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. And during that, what he does is he, he recruits all these, like, I would say leftover guys. Like, he, he recruits these disciples, these guys to disciple, and they weren't picked to be in, 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 in the elite schooling. They weren't picked to be there. They were, they, they were like, they, they didn't make the cut. But to Jesus, they were good. They were solid. So Jesus picks these guys. He, he equips them. He disciples them. And then he tells them to go do likewise. Then Jesus goes and dies on the cross, and, and he dies a sinner's death. He, he then resurrects um, into heaven. He defeats death. He conquers death, allowing anyone who believes in him now is reconciled and redeemed back to the Father, back into community with the Father. And so while this is happening, the disciples are over here, they're, 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 they're part of the advancing the pursuit of, of redeeming God's people. They are proclaiming the name of Jesus and what he has done, and people are placing their faith in Jesus. They're, they're literally like that, I believe in Jesus, and folks, people are coming in droves, and what's being created is the church. Just what God, what Christ has created and so what happens now is the church now becomes the instrument in advancing this pursuit that started all the way back in the garden. And that great pursuit back then is the same to us today. Jesus says it in Matthew 28, Go, God therefore says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So all this redeeming and reconciling the, 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 the world back to him, God has, has, has been about it from the very get-go. And what this good news, uh, what this pursuit is, is really the good news, the gospel. And so we gather here on Sundays to scatter, scatter to make disciples, loving them, baptizing them, teaching them, bringing them back into community with the Father, 
advancing the gospel. So for today, the question was like, man, so what do we teach? What do I teach? It was like I could teach Acts 1 verse 8. It says, you know, you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Or I could teach Mark 16 verse 15, go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Or I could teach Romans chapter 10 verse 13 and 14 that says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14, it says, how then will they call on him in in whom they have not believed. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Like I I could totally teach these verses, but but how, how do we witness? It says to go be witnesses. How do we do that? How do we proclaim the gospel? How does that actually look like? What does it look like? Then how do we preach? We would all agree that all of this is mission work, right? We would all agree we, this, is, this is what mission is about. But here's, here's where I have some friction and just conflict with, with stuff. What happens is a church, what the, well, not a church, the big C church overall, what happens is if we have created missions um, to, to be a ministry, okay, where, 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 where only those who have a heart for missions sign up. And so people who have time sign up for missions. People who have money, because it costs money, sign up for missions. People who are crazy enough to go like live and, and stay somewhere for 20 years, they sign up for missions. And so what happens is in the Big C Church, the mission ministry is, is only experienced by a handful of people. And the rest sits back, go home, park in our garage, lower the garage door, close the blinds. We stay in our homes. But when I look at scripture, it's really hard to find the passage that says, therefore, do this missions ministry. Like it's hard to find the passage that says, only those who who are, who are crazy enough to go evangelize. You see, when you look at Scripture, when you look at Scripture at missions, and when you look at Scripture when it comes to evangelism, it's not a ministry that only a few people do. Mission is the work of the Christian. It's what Christians do. If you are a teacher, yes, you are to teach students, but your mission is to advance the gospel. If you are a police officer, public safety is your job, but your mission is to advance the gospel. If you are a student, your job is to be educated and to learn, but your mission is to advance the gospel. If you are a farmer, your, your, your job is to produce fruit, but your mission is to advance the gospel. If you are a social worker, people is your job, but your mission is to advance the gospel. If you are a barista, You are to serve others with coffee. But your mission is to advance the gospel. You see, a Christian is a missionary. A Christian is a missionary. And so the truth is, if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be a a believer and a follower and an imitator of Jesus Christ, but the gospel is not something you want to advance, you is not something you want to take part of. Oh, like I'm not I'm not too sure I want to tell anybody about Jesus. Two things, honestly. It's either you're openly disobeying God or you really don't understand the gospel. So today, as we talk about we gather to scatter, I want to answer this question. How does a Christian live scattered? And as we answer that, my hope is that we, it would make sense then why we gather here 
to scatter. <coughs> Folks, pray with me. Father, you have been on this great pursuit. And just to be real, this pursuit that is now, now, now on us here, it is a daunting task for us here. But in light of what you have done, in light of what the work you have done through Jesus Christ in his life and his uh, life on cross and the resurrection, in light of that, it's only logical that we take part of this as well. And so for today, Father, I pray that we understand your words. I pray for focus. I pray for patience. I ask for diligence as we walk through this. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, reveal to us your will. And in the moments we're challenged today, I pray that we, the Holy Spirit, that you give us courage to respond. God, we're, we're glad that we get to gather here as a community to be encouraged, to pray, to learn, to fellowship. And so thank you for our time today. In your name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 is where we are going to be at today. After devoting 11 chapters in Romans, all of it in the first 11 chapters has been heavy-duty theology. Paul finally transitions from, from heavy-duty theology to, to more, of an, more of an action. He trans, transitions from doctrine to duty. He transitions from creed to, to conduct. He transitions from belief to behavior, from orthodoxy to orthopraxy. He transitions from uh, theology into what I saw yesterday online. It was a walkology. Like it's, it's the way we live. And in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, there's two appropriate responses that we will see to the theology of chapters 1 through 11. Now, I do have a request before we begin. As I said, Romans 12, 1 and 2, a lot of you guys are like, oh yeah, like we know that verse. Some of you guys may have just hearing it now, that's all good. If you know this verse, it is a familiar verse. Here's the thing, can we tighten it up today? Can we hone in, as much as you know this verse, as much as you understand this verse, can we, can we Tighten it up here today because if we're not careful, because we are so familiar with the verse, it can lead into passivity as we're hearing what God has to say. And so I want us this morning to take a new and a fresh look at these verses. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the first four words. I appeal to you. I appeal to you. Paul begins with an exhortation. He's, this is an urge. He, this is a, a plea. He's, it's, it's not a command. It's not a demand. It's Paul urging. He's exhorting his readers. In the Greek, um, the, 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 the way it's used carries a sense of urgency, but also with a note of authority. And so in the classical Greek, the same word was used to exhort troops uh, who are about to go into battle. And I'm like, man, that's perfect. Like this is, this, it's with a sense of urgency and with authority. And then Paul says, therefore, I appeal to you, therefore. The, he, the, what he means is he's, he's helping the readers understand everything that has come up to this very point. The question that everybody says to ask, like, why is therefore, therefore? And so what, he, what Paul is helping the readers is like, oh, okay, therefore what? Oh, everything in verses, in chapters 1 through 11. And so he's essentially saying, because everything I've said in chapter 1 through 11, Paul goes on and he says, brothers, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. What he means by this is he's talking to believers He's talking to people who, placed, who have placed their faith in Jesus. He's not talking to the missionary ministry. 
He's not talking to the evangelism ministry. He's not talking to pastors. He's not talking to the people on staff. He's not talking to church leaders. He is talking to Christians. Christians. Every Christian. Every Christian. And he says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. Paul is referring back to the first 11 chapters, and let me kind of skim through just to catch up. What are the mercies of God? In chapters 1, verse 18, through, through chapter 3, verse 20, Paul describes humankind as sinners. We are condemned sinners. There's nothing good about us. In chapters 3, verse 21, all the way up to 4, verse 25, you see, but, it says, but, you see, God, God shows his mercy through the person and the work of Christ by offering us a salvation as the free gift. And verses in chapter 5, all the way up to uh, halfway of chapter 8, you see God, you see Paul through God show his, how his mercy has freed us from the law and empowering us now through the work of the Holy Spirit to grow in Christ. Showing us the, 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 the blessings of full assurance, showing us the security of the relationship we have in God. And then in chapters 9 through 11, Paul informs us that God's love for his people is unconditional. Like it's just 11 chapters of just amazing authority. And so here he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. He'll say, because of everything he has done by the mercies of God. And on, on a bad day, like I do not remember the mercies of God. And so what happens is, is, is then I, I, I start to do things on myself. I, I kind of fall into this, like, uh, you know, just kind of works, unhealthy works mentality. And so I, I do things, like, just so I can check it off. But like, oh, yeah, this is good for God. Oh, yeah, this is good for God. And, and I do it in my, my personal life, in, my, in ministry, in marriage, and children. And, and all of it is because I've forgotten the mercies of God. And so I learned something a couple years ago by my mentor. He was just like, man, to remember what God has done for you, tell your story and tell it often. And the, and the reason why he says tell your story is because when we tell our story, when we tell people about Jesus and what he is changing in me, the sin that he's recovered me from, the sin that he's restoring me from, when we tell that to others, what happens is then we are reminded of the mercies of God. We're not bragging in any way. When you sit down with somebody at Starbucks and they're just talking and being, they're like, so what is it that you do? And you just start talking and be like, man, God is restoring me from anger. Like I am a compulsive leader and man, oh my goodness, I'm a pastor. And so a compulsive leader and pastor is like, man, if I'm not careful, I am gonna, that's going to seep into just ministry. And then, so I'm telling this, I'm telling this. And by, when I do that, I am reminded of God's mercies. That's what Paul is saying here, by the mercies of God, because of the mercies of God, he says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. <sighs> to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul says to present. Notice that he didn't say to yield your bodies. He didn't say to surrender your bodies, but he says to present your body. Yield and surrender are biblical terms, but they imply some sort of uh, like a measure of reluctance or hesitancy. You know, but to present, on the other hand, it implies like there's, there's gladness, there's, there's joy behind it. There's a willingness of, of offering oneself. Like if, if I were to yield and surrender a present to Liz... My wife, if you didn't know, <laughs> um, you know, she, she'd be like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, you, you surrender that. But if I were to present it, like, willingly and be happily, like, giving her something, there, it would be received different, I hope. Um, so so, so it just, I guess it depends on the gift, right? But, but so the, what, what I'm saying is our presentation to God ought to be joyful, ought to be with gladness. Like, we should be willing to. Why? By the mercies of God. And now what is it that we ought to present to God? 
our bodies. This is our physical body, but it's also our spiritual body. It's actually everything. Everything. Then he says, our bodies as a living sacrifice. The word sacrifice is defined as the act of giving up something that you want to keep. So offering our bodies as a living sacrifice really means to give up what you want, what I want, for the sake of the gospel. Like giving ourselves up totally to Jesus for the sake of the gospel. In other words, you are to sacrifice yourself, taking what you want to do, laying that aside, and doing what Christ wants. Now, if you, if you still don't understand it, if, if you don't know what it means, it means everything. Your time, your ambitions, your, your possessions, your ears, your mouth, the sexuality, it, 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 your mind, your emotions, your attitudes, your abilities. It is yourself, everything. In easier terms, it's pretty much your everyday, ordinary life, your thoughts, You're sleeping, you're eating, you at work, you with your family, all of that, all of that ought to be a living sacrifice to God. Now, just to clarify, this is not a sacrifice for our sins. Okay, in the Old Testament, animals were sacrificed for sins, but for us, this is completely and 100% worship. Like everything and every, anything we do honors, that honors God and pleases God. The sacrifice for sins, that's done already. That's done in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He did it. It is over. And so we respond by sacrificing our lives, our very being to him as an act of worship. And so as we sacrifice how everything to God, it's received as holy and acceptable to God, and it brings honor to God, and it pleases God. And it becomes, at the end of verse 1, it becomes our spiritual service of worship. The Greek word for spiritual is, is the word that we get um, logical from. Okay, and and, and, and the, the, the Greek word pertains, it means to, to reason or, 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 or the mind. And so, so, so the word spiritual doesn't really mean spiritual in the sense that we understand it. It's better translated as reasonable or, or rational. And so essentially in verse, in, in verse 1, the whole thing, what Paul is saying, man, if you consider all that God has done for you, that he became flesh for you, that he shed his blood for you, that he was crucified for you, that he died for you, that he resurrected for you, a sinful being, a holy God does this for a sinful being. The only reasonable response is to offer your life. You sacrifice your life for his sake. Romans 12, verse 1. To sum it up, it's pretty much the what, the what to do in response to God's mercies. Romans 12, 2 is another great verse. But this goes on to, to show us the how. Like, how do we actually live sacrificially? How do we actually live and do what honors God? How do we actually please Him? Verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There's two commands that we see here in Romans, in in verse 2. Two commands. One's a negative and one's a positive. The first one's a negative. Do not be conformed to this word, uh, to this world. The, 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 the term conformed literally means to, to be molded, to be, to be stamped according to a pattern. Like it's, and, 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 it's a, the, and this verb, it's, it's passive. The way it's used, it's passive, implying that if you are not actively and intentionally trying to resist the world, you are going to be conformed by the world. 
It's, if you are not actively and intentionally resisting the world, you will be conformed by the world. And so the world's philosophy, right? Like we all know it, like the world's philosophy, if you want it, go get it. Partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, possessions, power, title. Do, do whatever it takes to get what you want. Even use people if you have to. And if, if they're no good to you, kick, you know, kick rocks. Like you're gone, you're done, I'm moving on. Oh, and, and the truth, the whole thing, truth, right? When you go, oh, what's the truth? Oh, and pretty much the, what the public says is the truth is whatever the public agrees on or, or whatever is popular. And so they, they tell us these things, hey, keep faith private and keep, you know, all that other public. Like, you do not mix those things. No, 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 that, you, you don't bring those, those, those things. And then you have all these things, YOLO, you know, you live only once. And then, like, and then this world screams, like, like tolerance, like, all religions are the same. All religions are accepted. We all affirm, you know, sex and gay marriage and all this, all this stuff. And it keeps on going, it keeps on going, it keeps on going. Man, but if we take time to look at what God's Word says... There's a lot of things I just said to that do not be conformed to this world. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves right now is, so people know me as a pastor, but also a football player. So I get a lot of text messages from everyone across the board, believers or not. And, and just a couple, about two years ago, I just realizing people that are non-Christians, they're texting me and asking me for positive thinking. Hey, Pete, I'm about to go into a surgery. Can you send me some positive thinking? Or in other words, or can you send me some positive vibes? And, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, before, I was like, man, I got you. I'm going to positively think towards your way. Um, <laughs> or, or send you good vibes. No, and then, and, then, and then God's word started messing with me. And then I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, man, as Christians, we should never take part of that. We should, we should stop it in his tracks and say, you know what? No, I have a connection to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to send you positive thinking. That's not going to do nothing. I'm going to pray to Jesus Christ that he's going to come to you. That's what we're doing. And so what's happening is we, we are becoming conformed into the world, and we're like, man, yeah, I'm going to send you positive vibes. No, we have a direct, direct access to Jesus Christ. So this whole positive thinking stuff, that's not going to heal you. That's not going to save you. Jesus is going to save you. Folks, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. He says, don't even imitate it. Don't even match it. Don't even replicate it. But what? Next he says, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This is a process that begins from the inside, slowly transforming us from the inside because it changes our heart and our mind. What happens is our behavior follows along. And so when, when God's word like comes into us and it shapes us from the inside out, we begin to more look more like Jesus by how we act. And so, and so things, things begin to take shape. Actions begin to happen. Church, presentable lives, presentable sacrificial lives come from renewed minds. The mind is what controls the body. And to be honest, that's, let, let me be, I'm, I'm always trying to be real while I'm up here, so I never, but <laughs> it's, it's why we have Academy. It's why we have BSF. Like, and it's, we, we, we want to help the, 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 the gathering, get the, the community, the church to become biblically formed, to be molded up by God's word. And so we thought, hey, if we're going to, if this is what God's called us to do, let's do it together. So that's why we do it on Tuesday nights, on, on, on Wednesday nights, and on Thursday mornings. It's like we, we want people to, to come and get shaped by the God's word. But here's the thing, and here's the thing. I'm not sure why Academy and BSF is not maxed out. We've been trying to figure out why aren't these classes that, that we're, we're trying to, to be obey God and, and to grow biblically and so that we can practice it out. But these classes are not maxed out. And I'm not guilt tripping in you in any way. 
I just want us to do this together. Because the truth is, it's way easier together. It's way easier together. And so as we live out this life, living sacrificially for God, being transformed so that we are not conformed, what happens is, the end of verse 2 is that, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What Paul means by this is that as we live out this life, we will be, then see God's will for our lives. We will be able then to prove God's will by living life. And through living life, this way, we will see what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Let me read to you again those two verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Last week, when I was teaching up at Mount Hermon, I taught on worship to a bunch of junior hires, and, and, and not the singing kind of worship, okay? Like, worship is, is, is far more than just music. It is, it is a lifestyle, and, and it's, it's, it's unrelenting, like, just full-on worship, and, and so I teach on this passage, I'm preaching 12, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. And so I'm telling the junior hires, I'm, I'm painting them a picture. I'm saying, guys, like God is reaching this world and he is using you and I to reach this world. And all that he asks, all that he wants us to do is to respond accordingly to what, what he has done. And in this passage, it says that we ought to respond by, by being a living sacrifice, by presenting our bodies, everything and anything that we do is worship to God. And so I remember telling the junior hires, I'm like, man, hanging with your friends, hanging with your boys and your girls, that could be worship to the Lord. Playing a sport could be worship to the Lord. What you do on your phone when you're away in your bedroom under the covers could be worship to the Lord. When you're home alone could be worship to the Lord. As a student in school could be worship to the Lord. And so I'm, I'm telling the kids this and I'm like, man, it's, it's everything and everything that you do in response to what God has done to you. And through that, right, I said, man, guys, and through that, as you are worshiping God and everything that you do, he is going to reach your friends. He is going to reach your parents. He is going to reach your neighbors through you. He is going to reach your teachers through you. He is saying, all of them, they are going to see Christ, they're going to feel Christ, and they're going to experience Christ through you. And that's us advancing the gospel to the world. And so I'm, I'm telling them this, and then I go on, and I said, man, I said, guys, if we truly worship God with everything and anything that we do, I said, if we truly worship God with everything and anything that we do, there will be no need for missions. And they all sat back. I was like, what? Like, no, I was like, man, if we, if we truly worship God with everything and anything that we do in response to what God has done, there'll be no need for missions. Why? Because all of us are living this out. A sacrificial lifestyle, presenting our minds and our body, laying aside our ones, sacrificing all for God. Not because we have to. Not because we have to. Because how it's used in the Greek is because it's a joy. We're willing to. And when we do that, I said, Junior Harris, I said, living on mission happens. And it was at that moment 
that very moment, in my head, I'm like, that's what we're preaching on next week. It hit me because I was like, oh, that's why we gather. That's why we gather to be in community with God and with others. It's why we gather to learn God's word and to hear God's word. It's why we gather to fellowship with one another. It's why we gather to pray with one another. So you and I, so everyone here could be encouraged, exhorted, corrected, equipped, prayed, and reminded of, of God's mercies so that when we scatter, Wherever we come from, when we scatter, we are not just scattered people just doing what we are. No, we are scattered worshipers of God. Living sacrifice, sacrificially for God, worshiping God. Everything and anything we do, living on mission. And through that, people will see Jesus in us. People will hear Jesus from us, and people will experience Jesus through us. So why do we gather to scatter? It's to advance the gospel. But it's done by living sacrificially, by presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, a true transformation from the inside out, not being conformed to this world. Man, what is God calling you to sacrifice? Man, what is, what is God calling you to let go? Like, what, what is it that you're holding on to? What is it that you, you can't live, out with, live without? For some of us here, and you're, you're here and you probably have never understood the gospel clearly. And so you're hearing about this lifestyle and, and you're wondering, man, how could one live this sacrificial life for God? Why would anyone do that? Well, the truth is, like, we can do that. And, and, and it's not because of, of us. We do it because Jesus Christ did the same exact thing he's asking for us to do. Like, he sacrificed his life for you and I. He didn't have to, but he did. He decided to, to fully redeem us back to himself through himself. He came and he paid the ultimate price, and he died for you and I. A death that we deserved but by the mercies of God, he saved us. And all we have to do is transfer our trust from ourselves to him. And in response, live a sacrificial life for him. And if that's you today, if that's you and you're like, man, I've never really placed my faith in Christ. If that's you today and, and God, is, God is calling you, he is stirring in you, and you want to place your faith in Jesus, don't wait. Don't even wait for the song to come up. Don't even wait till I pray. Do it now. And if you're bold enough or if you encourage you, you want to come and pray, like during our music, even now, if you know I want us to pray, come now. Like, we'll, we'll pray for you. Because you cannot live and truly understand what a lifestyle for Christ understands until you understand what he has done for you. If you are a Christian, you are on mission 24-7. You are to worship 24-7. And so what? Is God calling you to sacrifice? What is he asking you to lay aside so that you, so he could use you to advance the gospel? For some of us, it may be our own family. For some of us, it may be what we wear. For some of us, it may be our time at work. For some of us, it may be what we listen to. 
It may be our friends. It may be the iPhones. It may be our own dreams. It may be something as simple where we hang out. It may be something that we drink. Or it may be something that we eat. It, whatever it is, whatever he's asking you, understand that he has died for you. I saw this lived out through my mom and dad. In 95, when they decided to leave New Zealand, where they decided to, to leave my, my grandparents, all my aunt, uncles, all my first cousins, they decided to move to the States. It was supposed to be here only for two years. But once we got here, we started going to school, and my sister going to college, and my dad was like, man, there's opportunities here. Like, nobody can go to college in New Zealand, but here, everybody can go to college. And so we started going to college, and it was only going to be until we go to college and go back home. That was in 95. It's 2018. Four out of the five of us have our masters. My two sisters have a, an amazing business going on in Reno. I can't say that one of my dreams was to be a pastor. That was, that was never it, but I'm a pastor now. But I'm, I'm telling you this because that watching my, my family, my mom and dad sacrifice things, helped me sacrifice my culture in 2013. You see, to leave the denomination that the Tongan people are all about, I had to call my dad and said, Dad, we're leaving the Methodist church for good. And while people don't understand, maybe some of you do with, you know, understand with the Catholic, you know, Catholic and, you know, Hispanic and stuff like that. But in the Tongan culture, man, it's either you're Methodist or you're Mormon. Those are the two things. There's no such thing as atheist. No, no, no. There's like you're, you're Methodist and Mormon. So, but majority of the people are Methodist. So when I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm leaving the culture. I didn't say the culture, but I'm leaving the church. That's pretty much saying you're leaving the culture. At the time, I did not understand that, it was a, that I was sacrificing the, the Tongan culture for the gospel. At the time, it didn't hit me till this past weekend. That's why it hit me. It hit me because I'm standing there, I'm like, I'm telling these kids, these junior hires, man, you got to sacrifice even your culture. And I'm like, ooh. And so this whole week, I've been getting jabs in the face because there are times where I just want to please people. And that's the struggle. But ultimately, we have to please and advance the gospel. And so whatever it is that God is asking you to do, understand that he's taking it to the top. He's, taking, he's like, man, I'm sacrificing myself. And so for me, the struggle is going back and forth with my culture. What is it for you? What is God asking you to lay aside so that he could use you to advance the gospel? Let's pray. Jesus, man, we... Such a convicting two verses from a convicting book that you wrote through Paul. It's really, it's hard to sit here and to understand where you're truly asking us. But at the same time, it's very easy and it's practical, yet we just choose not to. And we disobey. In these next few mo moments, Jesus, I pray that if, if you're asking us to truly just surrender and lay aside whatever it is you're asking us to, I pray that we can fully do that. For those who have not placed their faith in you, Jesus, I pray that we can stand and just fully give ourselves away to you and live life for you. Holy Spirit, help us not help this moment not be an emotional moment, but a moment that, that we are responding because we understand what you have done. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.